In this video, we're going to look at why Anglicans are in fact Protestants. And most importantly, we're going to talk about why it matters that Anglicans are Protestant in our theology and how Protestant theology is actually the answer and the solution to all of the problems that the Anglican communion faces. Now, some books that I would recommend to you to explain how Anglicanism is deeply Protestant at its core is The Heritage of Anglican Theology by J.I. Packer. That's a marvelous book that I really enjoyed reading. And also The Reformation Anglican Series, and that is edited by Ashley Knoll. That's a group of books about how Anglican theology is consistently reformed and Protestant. Now, if you were to look up Anglicanism or the Anglican Church online, say Wikipedia, what you'll find is that Anglicanism is considered to be Protestant. And indeed, for most of the history of the Anglican Church, Anglicans took it for granted that we were Protestant. However, since the Oxford movement of the 19th century, Anglo-Catholics are a very large group of Anglicans who say that Anglicans aren't Protestant, that they're simply Catholic. Now, I'll just say here for starters that to say that one is either a Protestant or a Catholic is not a good idea in my opinion. I consider myself to be a Protestant and a Catholic. And the reason why I consider myself to be a Protestant is because I think that Protestant theology is the most Catholic theology one can have. Now, since there are many Anglo-Catholics online who say that Anglican theology isn't Protestant, this raises the question, well, are we? Are we Protestant? And in my opinion, yes, Anglicans are Protestant, and Anglican theology is deeply Protestant at its core. And to explain why that is, we're going to first of all look at the history of Anglicanism, and then we're going to look at Anglican theology, and that's going to be the most important part of this video. So the word Protestant was first used to describe those who protested against the Roman Catholic Church's edict that Martin Luther and his theology was heretical. Those people who protested against that edict were the first people to be called Protestants. Now, it's important, therefore, to understand that the first Protestants were only in Germany and were only Lutherans, and it was also mainly a political term. It was used to describe the German states and leaders who protested what the Roman Catholic Church had said about Lutheran theology. So at, at first, it wasn't mainly used to describe individuals and their personal faith convictions. It was mainly political and it was exclusive to Germany. But as time went on, it eventually became the term used to describe all Lutherans. And eventually, much later, it was used to describe all people who came out of the Reformation of the 16th century. Now, the Oxford Dictionary's definition of a Protestant is this a member or part of the Western Christian Church that separated from the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. That's the definition. Now, based on that definition, the Anglican Church is obviously Protestant because the Church of England split from the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. Now, the question is, has the Anglican Church ever actually embraced that label of Protestant? And the answer is yes. It just took a while because it took a while for the word Protestant to mean more than just Lutherans. But once it started to embrace all people who came out of the Reformation, yes, the Anglican Church did use it of itself. So, for instance, in the Coronation Act of 1688, the monarch at their coronation solemnly promised to maintain the true profession of the gospel and the Protestant Reformed faith. Now, since the English monarch was the supreme governor of the Anglican Church, that is in itself an Anglican statement. Also, the Bill of Rights in 1689 meant that Roman Catholics were barred from becoming the monarch of England. And the reason why in the Bill of Rights is this. It hath been found by experience that it is inconsistent with the safety and welfare of this Protestant kingdom to be governed by a papist prince. So it's, it's defining England as a Protestant kingdom. And since the Church of England or the Anglican Church was the established Church of England, that is in itself saying that the Anglican Church was Protestant. 
Now, the Act of Union of 1800, which was made between England and Ireland, in its fifth article says this, that the Church of England and the Church of Ireland are united into one Protestant Episcopal Church. So that is explicitly saying that the Anglican Church is, of course, Protestant. And then lastly, the Episcopal Church in America, its official name is actually the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. So it's pretty clear then that throughout Anglican history, we have embraced the label Protestant. So that begs the question, why are there so many Anglo-Catholics who deny the label Protestant and say that Anglicanism isn't Protestant? Well, the reason why is because I think we are operating with different definitions of Protestant. So here's a definition of Protestant that I will give you that I have come up with myself that I think explains us a bit better. When most people say Protestant, what they mean by that is someone who looks back at the Reformation of the 16th century and thinks and believes that it was inspired by God, that it was a good thing that happened, and that the reformers who split from the Roman Catholic Church were acting on God's will, and also that therefore other Protestant denominations are our brethren as part of a common cause. So we see the Reformation as this wonderful act of liberation, and everyone else in that movement are our fellow brethren, essentially. Many Anglo-Catholics do not believe that. They don't think the Reformation was a good thing that happened fundamentally. Now, many Anglo-Catholics will think that the Reformation was a good thing, but not in all situations. So, for instance, they might think that it would have been better for Geneva to remain Roman Catholic than to become Calvinist. Or they may think that it would have been better for Scotland to have remained Roman Catholic than to have become Presbyterian. They will look at Roman Catholics as being our closer allies than, say, Presbyterians or Methodists or Calvinists. And based on that definition, they'll say that they're not Protestant because they don't think that the Reformation was entirely a good thing that happened. They may think that it probably would have been better for the Roman Catholic Church to have had a few reforms but not to have a total reformation with denominations splitting from the Roman Catholic Church. And that's fine. That's absolutely understandable and fair enough. And of course, a big part of Protestantism is that we believe that you have the freedom to have your own personal faith convictions. So it's okay for Anglo-Catholics, based on that definition, to say that they don't consider themselves Protestant. The question, though, is, is that an Anglican way of thinking? Is it the norm in Anglicanism to think that way? Or is it the norm in Anglican theology to actually think, no, we are Protestants and we do align ourselves with the other Protestant reformers? The answer I'll give is yes. In Anglicanism, I think based on our formularies and based on Anglican history, we should see ourselves as being Protestant even with that earlier definition I gave. So first of all, just the facts of it. The Anglican Church is in full communion with, for instance, the Lutheran Church, which shows that we see them as our allies. And remember, because the definition of Protestant was first used of Lutherans, we can conclude that if Lutherans aren't Protestant, no one is. Okay? Lutherans are the standard Protestants. That's going to be really important for later, actually, so I'd encourage you to keep that in mind as this video goes on. If Lutherans aren't Protestant, no one is. And since the Anglican Church is in full communion with the Lutherans, we therefore see those Protestants as our fellow brethren. Now, the formularies of the Anglican Church were by far mainly influenced and written by Thomas Cranmer. He's our most important Anglican theologian, and he absolutely saw himself as being part of the Protestant Reformation. He looked to people like Luther and Zwingli as his heroes, and his best friends and even mentors like John Hooper, Martin Bucer, and Peter Martin Vermigli, they were all ardent Protestants, and they saw what was happening in the European continent as ordained by God. Now, one of Thomas Cranmer's closest friends, who was also one of the most important figures in influencing what Anglican theology became, was Hugh Latimer. And here's a great quote from Latimer about Luther. Luther is that wonderful instrument of God 
through whom God hath opened the light of his holy word unto the world. So obviously these guys were looking at what Luther was doing and Luther's followers and seeing it as this great movement that they wanted to be a part of. Now there were many other figures who influenced Anglican theology. And during the Roman Catholic reign of Mary I, those people, most of them actually, fled England and they stayed with the Protestants in Europe. They stayed with Calvinists and Zwinglians and Lutherans. And when they came back, they were influenced by that theology. So they clearly saw Protestants as their allies in the big common cause against the Roman Catholic Church. Now, another key figure in influencing what Anglican theology is, is of course, John Jewell. John Jewell's most important book is The Apology of the Church of England. This was essentially the first Anglican book to be written. And Queen Elizabeth I loved this book so much that she wanted a copy of it to be in every single parish in England. And in that book, John Jewell clearly understands the Church of England to have been part of the wider Protestant Reformation. He sees Zwinglians and Lutherans and Calvinists as his allies in the big struggle. And in fact, the apology of the Church of England is less an apology of Anglicanism and more so an apology of the Reformation itself and simply defending the fact that the Reformation was a good thing that happened and was ordained by God. Here's a quote from John Jewell that explains that. 40 years ago, truth unknown and unheard of began to dawn and to cast a ray on the thick darkness of these times. When Martin Luther and Zwingli, most excellent men, and sent by God to give a light to lighten the world, first came to knowledge of the gospel. So you obviously see Zwingli and Luther as these great men, in fact, almost like prophets sent out into the world. And the fact that he says they came to knowledge of the gospel shows that John Jewell, as a Protestant, thinks that the gospel was being hidden away and concealed and then was brought to light by the Protestant reformers. John Jewell sees the Anglican church as falling under that stream. We are a Reformation church with a Protestant heritage and a Protestant theology. And that mindset is actually encapsulated in English history as well. Since the reign of Henry VIII, the English nation sought alliances with Protestant kingdoms against the Pope's sphere of influence over the rest of Europe. And also the Bill of Rights of 1689 has an article that says that the English monarch has to come to the defense of Protestant kingdoms if they're ever under attack. So they clearly see the Protestant part of Europe as our allies against the Roman Catholic part of Europe. And that's really important because England, of course, was part of Anglicanism. The Church of England, the Anglican Church, is the established church of England. So what the English government and monarch had to do says something about what Anglicanism is. So that concludes the historical part of this video. We've clearly seen that throughout Anglican history, the Anglican Church understood itself to be Protestant. The question now is, is Anglican theology in accordance with Protestant theology? So first we have to ask, what is Protestant theology? Now, John Mason Neal was an Anglo-Catholic, and he's one of the strongest voices who oppose the idea that Anglicans are Protestant. And here's a quote from him. You mean by Protestant, a man who protests against the sacramental system of the church, against baptismal regeneration, against the divine gift of the Holy Ghost in confirmation, against the real presence, against the apostolic succession, against the power of absolution. Therefore, it was that I said that the Church of England never was, is not, and by God's grace never will be Protestant, because she holds as most necessary truths every one of these blessed doctrines. The reason why this quote is completely ridiculous is that the word Protestant was, remember, first used of Lutherans. And we agreed that if Lutherans aren't Protestants, no one is. Lutherans believe in the sacramental system of the church. Lutherans believe in baptismal regeneration. Lutherans believe in the divine gift of the ghost in confirmation. Lutherans believe in the real presence more than Anglicans do because Anglicans believe that the body and blood of Christ 
are only eaten and drunk in our hearts by faith, whereas Lutherans believe in the corporeal presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They think he's physically present. They believe in apostolic succession. They believe in the power of absolution. So we need to find a new and better definition of what Protestantism is. Now, the good news is that it's actually pretty easy to summarize what Protestant theology is all about. We need to define what it is that Protestants are against and what it is that Protestants are for. And it's really simple to understand what those are. So we'll start with what Protestants are against. And this is important because remember, to be called a Protestant means that you are protesting against the Roman Catholic Church and the errors that we think they made. So we need to start off with what the things are that we are opposed to. Now, there are minor issues, such as the celibacy of priests. There's also praying to saints, which in the context of everything in the Reformation was actually a minor issue. Then there's the three major issues that Protestants reject, and essentially there's three. The first one is papal supremacy, the idea that the Bishop of Rome or the Pope was the infallible head of the church who could decree what God's will and God's truth was infallibly, and that you had to assent to his authority in order to be saved. That if you weren't in a church that saw him as its figurehead, there was no hope of your salvation. That is completely rejected, but especially the idea that the Pope can infallibly tell you what the truth of God is, and the fact that you had to listen to him. You had to believe in what the Pope taught in order to be saved. That's rejected. And at the end of this video, we're going to look at what the principle behind us rejecting papal supremacy is and why that principle is so important in the current fights today within the Anglican Communion. Now, the next thing that all Protestants reject are indulgences. Indulgences are essentially things, maybe, for instance, things that you can buy, that when you purchase them, it actually helps your salvation. It means that you have less time spent in purgatory or that some of your sins are forgiven, that kind of issue. That is obviously rejected by Protestants. And the principle behind it is that we reject the idea that you can be saved or forgiven of your sins by anything other than a living faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You can't just buy some medal and all of a sudden that counts towards your salvation. Salvation is a matter of the heart and the heart's longing for and faith in and love for Jesus Christ as our Lord and God. It's not a matter of buying things. And the third thing that all Protestants reject, and in fact the most important thing that they reject, is the sacrifice of the Mass. The idea that the Eucharist is a propitiation offered by priests to save you and to forgive your sins. Here's a quote by Luther on the sacrifice of the Mass in his book, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. The sacrifice of the Mass is the most wicked and dangerous abuse of all. The Eucharist is not a work which may be communicated to others. It's completely rejected. And also Thomas Cramner regarded the sacrifice of the Mass as also being the number one issue that he protested about in his writings. Now, this idea of the Eucharist being a propitiatory sacrifice offered by a priest to forgive you of your sins is rejected by the 39 Articles of the Anglican Church. Article 31 says this, The offering of Christ once made is that perfect redemption, propitiation, and satisfaction for all the sins of the world. And there is no other satisfaction for sin. Wherefore, the sacrifice of masses, in which it was commonly said that the priest did offer Christ for the quick and the dead, to have remission of pain or guilt, were blasphemous fables and dangerous deceits. So we totally reject that idea, and that puts us squarely within what Protestant theology rejects about the Roman Catholic Church. Now, what's important about this? Why is it important that we reject the sacrifice of the mass and indulgences? It's important because we reject an ex opere operato view of sacraments and salvation and, of course, indulgences too. As Protestants, Anglicans believe that our salvation is, like I said before, a matter of the heart. You are saved because you love Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ. 
You believe that he was raised from the dead. You believe that he was born of a virgin. You believe that he performed miracles, that he is the truth of God, that everything he said is true, that everything he said is to be obeyed, that he, is, that he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and is our Lord and our God and our Savior and our Messiah. If you believe that in your heart, if you cling to Jesus Christ in your heart, then you are saved. Your salvation is not about external things that people do for you regardless of your faith. We don't believe that you can go into a shop, buy a medal or buy a relic, and all of a sudden that means that you have a better hope of salvation. That's not how it works. We don't believe that your salvation is about turning up to church and watching a priest perform a propitiatory sacrifice, and then you get to go home knowing that you are cleansed of your sins. No, your salvation is about you and your relationship to Jesus Christ that happens within your heart and expressed throughout your life. Nothing else matters. That is distinctly Protestant, and that goes against what the Roman Catholic Church was doing back then and still teaches today, and it also goes against what the Eastern Orthodox Church believes, because they also believe that the Eucharist is a propitiatory sacrifice. We reject that view. That makes us Protestant, because within Christianity, only Protestants can agree on this, that we are against those ideas. So that summarizes what Protestants are against, and of course the Anglican Church is also against those things. Now it's time to look at what Protestants are for. And I think the standard definition of what Protestant theology is, what Protestants believe, are what we call the five solas. So what are the five solas? Well, the word sola means solely, or only, or alone. So we're saying that these five things alone save you. Now, many people will object and say, no, no, they're just saying what justifies you. And, and justification meaning you are declared righteous before God. And so a lot of people think that your justification and your salvation are essentially separable. So you could actually be justified and not be saved at the end of your life, or that you could lose your justification. Article 17 of the Anglican Articles of Religion makes it very clear that if you're justified, you will never lose that justification and you will certainly be saved. Because if God has declared you to be righteous, it's because he predestined that to happen. And if you're righteous, God is not going to take your righteousness away because, well, that would be unrighteous of him. And if you're righteous, you will be saved because God is not going to condemn a righteous person. So, for instance, for us to believe that you are justified by faith alone does indeed mean that we think you will be saved by faith alone, because you can't be justified and not saved, and according to Article 17, you can't be justified and go on to lose your justification. It's a permanent thing that happens. Article 17 teaches, essentially, the eternal security idea of the fact that if you have a saving faith in Christ— you will be assured of salvation because God gave you that faith as a gift, just like he predestined to do. So what are the five solas then? Now, first of all, two of them are not particularly important and aren't particularly worth talking about. It's sola Christus and sola Dio Gloria. What essentially that means is solely by Christ and solely for the glory of God. The reason that's not so much worthy of talking about is because all Christians can agree that we're saved by Christ alone for the glory of God alone. So they're not particularly distinctively Protestant, and that's why I won't talk about those in the video. The first three solas are the ones that are the most important. So the first one, sola gratia, that is solely by grace. You are saved by grace alone. What that means is your salvation is a gratuitous gift that God gives you, not based on anything that you have done or deserve. You can't say, gosh, I really worked hard for my salvation. I'm so happy I got it. No, nope, it's a gift. You didn't deserve it. There's nothing that you can do to make you worthy of salvation. It is entirely, entirely a gift. Number two, sola fide, solely by faith, by faith alone. We are saved and justified only by a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, sola scriptura. Our faith has to solely be based on what scripture teaches us about Christ and, of course, about God and the history of God's people. So what that means is 
you do not have to believe everything the church teaches that isn't based on scripture. And that's what was happening in the Middle Ages and continues today. Where in the Roman Catholic Church, you do have to believe in everything the church teaches, even if scripture doesn't talk about it, such as purgatory or the Immaculate Conception of Mary. That's not in scripture, but to be a Roman Catholic, you have to believe those to be saved, and we reject that view. The only things that you have to believe are the things that are found explicitly in Scripture. Now we're going to look at how Anglican theology abides by those solas and is therefore Protestant. So the first one, sola gratia, only by grace are we saved. Article 17 of the Anglican Articles of Religion says that it is God's grace alone that predestines us for salvation and then goes on to save us. So before we were even born, God chose us to be part of his elect who he will save, and you did nothing to deserve that because you hadn't even been born yet. So it's only by God's grace that you're saved. Number two, sola fide, that you are saved only by your faith. Here's what Article 11 says. We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith. Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine. And again, Article 17 says that if you're justified, you will be saved. So we are justified and then saved by faith alone. Now, many people will think, okay, well, that's just what the Anglican Articles of Religion says. I don't have to believe that to be an Anglican, and the rest of the Anglican formularies don't teach that. Well, that's not true either. Dom Gregory Dix, a famous Anglo-Catholic, just about as much an Anglo-Catholic as you could get, says that the 1662 liturgy was the only successful attempt to ever give liturgical expression to the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. You can watch my hour-long video that goes through that Eucharistic liturgy, and it proves how, yep, it is expressing a justification by faith alone theology. So Anglican theology is deeply rooted in the Protestant idea of justification by faith alone, which only Protestants teach. And number three, sola scriptura. Article 6 says, Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man that it should be believed as an article of faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. So we reject the idea that you also have to obey what the church teaches, even if Scripture doesn't explicitly teach that. That makes us Protestant. We believe in the five solas. We reject the things that Protestants reject. And throughout history, it's very clear that the Anglican Church understood itself to be Protestant. That basically just resolves the question. We are indeed Protestant. Now, many Anglo-Catholics don't call themselves Protestants, don't regard themselves as Protestants. That's also fine. But the point is, that is not the norm in Anglicanism. That is not the standard way of viewing Anglican theology. It's fine for Anglicans to think that, but don't say that that is what all Anglicans must be. You can't say that Anglican theology at its core, based on the formularies, is not Protestant, because it clearly is. If you don't consider yourself to be Protestant, that is fine. Now we come to what is by far the most important part of this video. Why does it matter? Who cares? It's just a label, right? Why does it matter if we're a Protestant or not? And sure, if Protestant is just a label, it doesn't matter because who really cares what, what word you want to put on it, right? But what does matter is that we understand Anglicanism to have a Protestant theology and a Protestant mindset. And why that's important is because I think Protestant theology is the answer to the problems within the Anglican communion. And it's when we forgot about our Protestant heritage and our Protestant theology that the problems started to crop up. Let's have a look at them. First of all, we said that one of the key things that Protestants opposed was the idea of papal supremacy. Why? Well, we opposed the idea that the church can tell you what truth is, what God wants, regardless of what scripture may say about it. We say you have to assent to scripture. If scripture says one thing and the church says another thing, you side with scripture. The church does not have the authority to just tell you what God's will is without reference to scripture. 
Why is that so important today? Well, isn't that not what the Episcopalian Church did in America? And also the Church of Canada and the Church of Scotland and the Church of Wales and the list goes on. The Episcopal Church said that God's will is for people who are homosexual to be married in a same-sex relationship. That God wants that to happen. That God likes it when that happens, regardless of the fact that Scripture makes it clear and explicit over and over and over again that that's not the case. So what's happened there is we've forgotten the Protestant doctrine. We've actually gone back to a papal supremacy mindset where it doesn't matter what the Bible says. Listen to me. The church is what matters. Don't worry about that. We're the authority. We're the living authority. We get to decide what God's will is. No, no. Protestants reject that idea. If your church is saying this and scripture is saying something completely different and scripture is contradicting what your church is saying, then it's time to reject the church and follow scripture. That is the Protestant mindset. And that's how we got into this mess in the first place. The Episcopal Church forgot its Protestant heritage and greedily sought after more power and authority. And that is what we reject. Number two, we said that Protestants oppose indulgences and the sacrifice of the Mass. Why do we oppose those? Because they say that your salvation is predicated on external things that have nothing to do with your living faith in Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because it combats nominalism. Nominalism is the mindset that it doesn't matter if you don't have a living faith in Christ. What matters is that you you do the things. You do the Christian things. You go to church every Sunday. You take communion. You baptize your kids when they're born. Hey, I'm a Christian. Whenever there's a survey, I say I'm a Christian. I don't have a living faith in Christ. I don't live like a Christian. I don't read my Bible every day. I don't pray every day. Eh, doesn't matter. I'm a Christian. That's nominalism, and that's a big, big problem in the Anglican church where there's so many people who go to church every Sunday who just have that nominal faith. They don't have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't love him. They don't serve him. They don't believe in him with their whole mind and soul as their Lord. And the Protestant opposition to indulgences and the sacrifice of the Mass has something to say about that issue. Because we say, it doesn't matter if you go to church every Sunday and you take the Eucharist every Sunday. It doesn't matter. It's not doing anything for you if you don't have a living faith. It's not about the external things that you do. It's not about being baptized as a baby and being confirmed when you turned 11 or going to a Christian school, turning up to church. It doesn't matter. If you don't have that living faith, it's all worthless. That's what we're saying. And that actually combats this nominalism issue. Sure, do turn up to church, but hopefully that's because the church will evangelize you and give you a living faith. That's another issue that we see in the liberal quarters of the Anglican Communion, where priests and the clergy are forgetting their duty to evangelize their people. Just think about John Spong as the bishop. He had no interest in evangelizing his flock. He had no interest of bringing people to a living faith in Christ. Why? Because he didn't have that faith himself and he thought it was all just silly anyway to have it. That is a huge problem. Instead, if the church realizes that based on its Protestant theology, it doesn't matter unless you have a living faith, the church will step up to the task and evangelize its own people, rather than only caring about money and being more woke. And now for the solas. So the first one, sola gratia, that you are saved by grace alone. That completely demolishes the liberal mindset that, well, if you're a good person and if you're woke, you'll surely be saved. You deserve it. You're a good person. You're great. You're worthy of being saved. You deserve it. Everyone is so great. Oh, okay. You don't believe in Jesus. You belong to another religion. You're an atheist. Or you say that you're Christian, but you live an immoral life. Well, that's okay. God loves you anyway. Do you deserve to be saved? You're a good person. No, Protestant theology rejects that completely. You are saved by grace alone. You do not deserve it. What you deserve is God's wrath. What you deserve is damnation. The problem is you. You are a bad person. But God, in his glory, in his greatness, in his, in his grace, in his love, and his majesty, saves you regardless of that. Because he loves you. Because God is better than you. 
because God is better than everything. You are worthless. God is worthy of everything. You don't have genuine selfless love. God does. So we're always pointing it to God's glory, and that completely shatters that liberal mindset that has so plagued the church. Because the church actually teaches this in many quarters. Well, it's okay. Ah, you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to love Jesus. You don't have to believe in Jesus to be saved. You, you deserve it. No. We made that mistake because we forgot our Protestant theology. And that's so important to remember it because then that combats these issues. Okay, number two, sola fide, that you are saved by faith alone. We've sort of already talked about that. If you don't have a living faith in Christ, nothing that you do matters. Finally, sola scriptura, that you have to believe in what the Bible teaches. Again, that combats the liberal mentality of many quarters of the Anglican Communion that teach things that go against scripture. Sola scriptura calls that to account but also the liberal quarters of the Anglican Church that calls you to actually question Scripture, to not believe in it. Ah, uh, how, well, miracles don't happen. Jesus' resurrection must have been a myth, surely, right? Because people just don't rise from the dead. Jesus couldn't have healed the sick. I've never seen a miracle in my life. Surely that can't happen. And this whole idea of there being a God, well, hmm, I don't know if that's if we can really believe that anymore. Parting the Red Sea definitely didn't happen. You see, they question it. And bishops teach this. Zhong Spong taught this. He taught his own flock to question the Bible. Our Protestant theology says, no, you have to believe in the Bible. The Bible is God's word written. And if you, as a bishop, are teaching that we shouldn't believe in Scripture, well, I will not obey you. I will obey Scripture. Scripture is the only authority that I am under, because it is the only way of knowing for sure what God's will is. It's only in Scripture that we have God's infallible word written for us. So that again combats the problem of liberal bishops, but also tells us the solution. What is the solution? The solution is to side with Scripture. If your church is teaching things contrary to Scripture, if your church is actually telling you to not believe scripture, if your church is not evangelizing its own flock, if your church doesn't care if they have a living faith, then just like Luther, just like Zwingli, just like Calvin, just like Cranmer, scripture is the truth. If the church has decided to step out of that truth and teach things that are completely contrary to it, it's time to make a stand. Just like Luther famously said, here I stand. You will stand with Scripture. So that's the solution for the Anglican Church. Sometimes there are parts of the church that are beyond helping, unfortunately. And that's what Luther saw himself. He wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. He begged them. He nailed those 95 theses to the Wittenberg Church door. He met with them. He spoke with them. He debated. He wrote many, many, many letters and books. And you know what? They didn't listen. They didn't listen. And then there's a point, and it's a difficult point, where we have to say, well, if you're not going to listen, then I can't have fellowship with you anymore. That's what Luther did, and that's what our Protestant heritage is all about. It's about the Protestant reformers saying, I need to make a stand, and that means that I can't stand with you anymore. And that's the solution to our problems today. And that's what's happened with GAFCON. That's why the ACNA was formed, because Anglicans in America said, you know what, the Episcopal Church just isn't listening and simply is not going to change. And so we need to make a stand. And that's what happened in my country of New Zealand too. That's why my wife and I joined the Church of Confessing Anglicans. That's why we became part of GAFCON, because we felt that our church, the Anglican Church in New Zealand, was at a point where it was not following scripture and was not following our Protestant theology of saying that scripture is what matters. So, a bit controversial. I'm assuming this is going to be one of those videos where I'm probably going to lose more subscribers than gain, and that's fine. This is where I stand. We are Protestant, and it's very important to remember those Protestant doctrines that we have because they are the solution to our problems. Once we forget about Protestantism, we open the door to all these issues. Okay, so thank you for watching. 
If you disagree, that's okay. You know, maybe make a comment uh, down below about why you disagree. We can have a good discussion about it. I hope you enjoyed the video at least. I hope that it was educational for you. And as always, God bless.